All right, we'll get started here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on the future of, lo of local meat markets. Um, it sounds like we've got somebody unmuted here. Just a moment. All right, so welcome again to our discussion on the future of local meat markets. We're very happy to have you join us and we look forward to what will no doubt be a useful and informative conversation. I'd like especially to welcome our two speakers. First, Senator Tom Brandt, who in addition to serving as a state senator, uh, also farms outside of Plymouth, and has worked on issues pertaining to small meat producers and processors in the legislature. And second, I'd like to also welcome Kevin Barnhill, the owner of the Blair Meat Market in Blair, Nebraska. We're thankful to both of you for taking the time uh, to be here and to share your knowledge and perspective with us. This evening, we're going to talk about the present challenges facing livestock farmers, meat lockers, and consumers, and everyone involved in the local meat economy, as well as possible solutions that could serve farmers, butchers, and customers, including uh, a proposed state meat inspection program. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit packing plants this spring, it exposed weaknesses in the dominant meat supply chains as they exist today. With large processing plants shut down, many producers had to euthanize significant numbers of livestock. Animals intended for large meat processors soon flooded smaller meat lockers, pushing out normal co uh, customers and creating long wait lists. Meat prices shot up, store shelves were sometimes empty, and consumers faced purchasing limits. That state of affairs left everyone involved looking for better ways of doing business. Uh, we're going to hear from Senator Brand and Mr. Barnhill about their experiences, their perspectives on the present challenges, and their thoughts on what solutions might look like. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to our speakers for about 10 minutes each in introductory remarks. And after that discussion, uh, we'll take some audience questions. When the time comes, you can enter your questions into the chat function on Zoom or as a comment on our Facebook live stream. And we'll share those questions with our speakers. And with that, Senator Brandt, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Nathan, for uh, having me uh, this evening on this timely discussion. Uh, I'll give you a little background on who I am. Uh, I know I haven't had the opportunity to uh, meet with a lot of you, you yet. Some of you have. I see Dave sitting up there. I talk to him quite regularly. But uh, I grew up here in Plymouth, Nebraska, uh, graduated from Tri-County High School in 1978 attended the university, earned a degree in agriculture, double major ag econ and mech ag, and managed to graduate in 1982. And for those of you old enough to remember, uh, that was the last meltdown in agriculture that started. Uh, I was supposed to work for a uh, tractor manufacturer like International or Alice Chalmers, and they all went belly up at that time. And so I just sort of threw my name in the hat and I ended up working in meatpacking for the next eight years. Uh, first two years at a university, I worked for Lewis Rich, Oscar Meyer as an industrial engineer and learned all aspects of turkey uh, processing and production. And then after that, believe it or not, I got my dream job with IBP in Dakota City. I was the industrial engineer there for uh, a year, year and a half. Uh, then I got transferred. I had the Amarillo plant for a year and a half. And one of the good things in Texas is I met my wife down there. Uh, then I got moved back to corporate in Dakota City um, and got transferred from industrial engineering over to project engineering and actually managed the buying stations from the engineering side. We had 110 hog buying stations and did that for six months. And then after that, we were building a plant in Waterloo. Uh, I was instrumental in designing the kill line on the Waterloo pork plant, which at that time was the largest in the world and we ran a dual kill line. That was the first in the world ever to do that. And shortly thereafter, we bought, or actually the state of Nebraska all but gave IBP that old combine plant in Lexington. And uh, my wife and I were the first engineers on site there. And we walked into this thing and basically we had a 10 acre machine shed with a leaky roof and two EPA waste sites and uh, we managed to successfully build a USDA inspected meat packing plant in there. Uh, so then about 1990, I came home to farm and we've been here ever since. Uh, we've 
been raising hogs that whole time, but I can tell you I'm about out of the hog business. We just use uh, hooped hog buildings. And with some of the difficulties we're going through now, and I'm 60 years old, we're just gonna call it quits here as soon as this last group of hogs is gone. And we have a cow-calf operation and I buy feeder cattle and we'll finish about 150 head of cattle. Um, and then actually about five years ago, we used to have sheep also, and, and we got rid of the sheep when the kids left. So I'm on all sides of this thing. As a producer, uh, I understand how a processor uh, works. And yesterday we picked up a whole beef from the pick roll locker, and I've never paid so much for processing. That cost us $714 to have a beef slaughtered. And I, you know, so it's it, times are good if you're in this in this business right now because there aren't enough shackle spaces out there uh, to accommodate everybody. So there's a lot of potential in the state of Nebraska for processing. Okay, and that's our bottleneck right now is. And I think Kevin will probably speak to that when, when he gets his shot here next, uh, because we have a lot of producers that would like to see more shackle spaces out there, whether that's um, exempt or not exempt spaces, uh, preferably non-exempt. Uh, and so one of the things that we in the legislature are looking at is taking a run at state meat inspection. And we've got an interim study. And what an interim study is, is from the time that we adjourn, which this year was about August 13th, till we start back up the first week in January, we do interim studies. And one of the interim studies that the Ag Committee has is to look at state meat inspection again. And I think it's been a number of years since we've done this. And one of the resources that I have found that is a very good resource is the University of Nebraska in 2001 did a report for the legislature on this very subject. Uh, it's 75 pages. Uh, you can access that. And it's very timely. Not a lot has changed in 20 years. I talked to Professor Sullivan in the meat department, UNL Meats this afternoon, and he agreed um, that since that report was published till now, not a lot of things have changed. So. Uh, if you would read that report, it's one that the university did for the legislature on the pros and cons of, of state meat inspection. And their conclusion at the end of the day was six of one, a half dozen of another. And we'll probably get into more detail on that as we go through our questions. Kevin? Oh, thank you, Senator. <laughs> I just thank, thank I wanted you. to see if Nathan had something to add or I was just kind of waiting to see where we were gonna go. Uh, my name is Kevin Barnhill. And uh, as Nathan mentioned, I do own the Blair Meat Market in Blair, Nebraska. Uh, I bought that plant six years ago when it was idle. Uh, it had been idle for a year or better. And um, so I restarted it, remodeled it. Uh, and we are now a federally inspected facility. It took us a while to get there, and we can talk about the hurdles that extremely small uh, uh, packers or extremely small lockers have in dealing with the USDA and, and their kind of one-size-fits-all model. Uh, prior to the Blair Meat Market, I was uh, vice president of uh, purchasing and risk management at Adams Land and Cattle Company out of Broken Bow. Uh, I came from a working ranch. I grew up on a working ranch in North Texas, a uh, cow-calf operation, uh, and my family had meat markets in town. So I've been cutting meat in my family markets since, wow, it's a long time ago, so since, well, over 40 years I've been cutting meat, got my uh, degree at Arizona State University in ag business and meat sciences, uh, did some time at uh, Beef America here in Omaha, uh, spent some time at Montfort out of Greeley. Uh, then I was hired by Conagra Foods and uh, finished my corporate stint as director of uh, global procurement at Conagra Foods. Spent about 10 years uh, commuting back and forth, working in Brazil. I built two plants in Brazil and sourced a lot of protein out of Brazil for Conagra Foods. Uh, and so that was how we ended up back in Nebraska. We, uh, My wife and I have lived in uh, Arizona, Nebraska, Illinois, Colorado, and then I grew up in Texas. Uh, 
I, it's interesting, uh, Senator, that you picked up a, 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 a beef and it cost $700. Uh, and you know, considering where we were even five years ago, uh, that's a little bit of an increase. But I, I found that, especially in the very small, the regulatory environment is very expensive for very small uh, producers. And that's why we're, we're struggling to keep, to grow and get shackle space. It, it's a lot of it's about the regulatory environment and uh, opportunities for expansion. Uh, not all uh, cities are can deal with the BOD and the wastewaters. Uh, uh, like my town, Blair, they can't deal with it. So I have to capture all of my uh, slaughter effluent and then have it pumped and land applied. Uh, other folks can go straight to city, uh, city sewer systems and water treatment. So there's a lot of uh, nuance to adding shackle space into either already existing plants or building new plants. And a lot of it is the struggle with regulatory and disposal. Uh, other than people, my biggest expense, and that's a big chunk of that bill, is uh, uh, hide disposal and, uh, off, and uh, uh, viscera, fat, bone, blood, guts. Uh, I pay well over $1,000 a month uh, just to Darling International to haul off my bones and fat. So they're very expensive. Uh, I'm actually looking at ways to uh, compost. Uh, instead of having to haul off to save a little money. So that's, uh, that's kind of the long and short of where I'm at. Uh, I, I do think state inspection would be a, uh, a help to Nebraska, especially because uh, I deal with, uh, I actually see several of my customers on the phone here. Uh, the uh, direct consumer, I do a lot of direct consumer work for folks that are trying to gain a little bit more control of their own destiny and create their own niches, either through farmer's markets, uh, which is a whole different story of what those folks will and won't allow, uh, or uh, internet sales. I'm also uh, consult to some uh, bigger players than who I am uh, and feed yards out west uh, who are looking at putting in plants to take their own production. They're tired of the, uh, the uh, lack of vis visibility in the market to the packers. You know, that was another thing the federal side was dealing with this, this year was uh, the, the thinly traded cash market. So we've got a lot of hurdles and a lot of things in front of us. Some of them new uh, due to COVID. Some of them not so new. They've kind of been around for a while. Yeah, thanks to both of you uh, for that. That helps us, I think, get a picture of some of the regulatory hurdles and some of the expenses that make it difficult for uh, new meat lockers to start up or difficult for meat lockers to compete or to provide all the services that they'd like to. Um, I do want to go through some of these questions specifically in the interim study and just get your thoughts on those um, since we're talking about the meat inspection. The first uh, of those questions in the study asks, uh, what are different ways that cattle producers and meat processors can, pay, processors can take advantage of federal law and legislation to allow intrastate, interstate, and e-commerce sales of state inspected meat, uh, you know, should that program be established? Um, I don't know how well versed uh, the group is that I'm talking to about state meat inspection. You basically have either USDA or a state meat inspection, and about half the states have state meat inspection. And you have to be equal to or better than USDA regs. USDA, if you are USDA inspected, you have the right to sell interstate anywhere in the United States. If you are a state meat inspected, even though you meet USDA regulations, you are allowed only to sell intrastate, inside the state of Nebraska. The argument has always been that if I'm meeting the USDA regs, why can't I sell across state lines? Um, I think about 20 years ago, Senator Daschle introduced a bill that allowed like states that have state meat inspection to sign a cooperative agreement so that like 
Kansas has state meat inspection and Wisconsin has state meat inspection, they can sign a cooperative agreement that they can sell meat across the borders between those two states. If you look this up, there's some of this going on that the states that have state meat inspection can do a cooperative agreement to sell just between those states. So that's a hurdle that someday may change, uh, but that's probably one of the, the bigger uh, drawbacks of a state meat inspection. Um, and it sort of depends how big your market is in the state that you're in. Nebraska, we've got 1.92 million people. Um, it can be a very good market depending on what you've got. But if you could access Kansas City, uh, Des Moines, uh, Denver, uh, some of these bigger metropolitan areas, you've got a much bigger market available to you. And that really isn't there with state meat inspection. Correct, uh, but there are some states that have also have reciprocity with the federal government. So that I know in Ohio, for example, they uh, have a state inspection service and they have uh, uh, interstate agreements as, as the Senator mentions, but they also have a reciprocity agreement with the federal government. So they can sell interstate, even with just their state inspection stamp. And there's a couple of states like that. I'm not that familiar with that program, but I do know it exists. Uh, and, uh, but at the end of the day, you do have to be at or equal to state inspection and, uh, or, or federal inspection. And the issue though, is that federal inspection is, ge is not geared to the small or very small plant. Uh, it really is a one size fits all uh, kind of model that's geared toward the bigger plants at say thousand head or larger kind of guys. Uh, and so um, that could be thousand head a day or larger kind of guys, anything less than that. And you're considered a small and then you get down into the local locker and we're, we're very small. So the advantages to state meat inspection is you could get to uh, uh, allow people to do intrastate commerce that maybe either are interested in, in interstate commerce or don't have the wherewithal or even the capacity, but they're, they are serving a block of customers that would like to get away from the not for sale stamp. Uh, you know, the, the public doesn't really understand the differences between uh, exempt and inspected. And, and so all they see is not for sale on that label. And, and that causes some marketing hurdles for smaller producers, hobby pharmacists, uh, local organic producers. And so that's where I think a state inspection service would be beneficial uh, in that we could create some intrastate commerce for the very small. Uh, if you get to that small to medium, I think federal is probably your better bet. If I could follow up, what Kevin said is, is very accurate. In the research that I've read, the USDA doesn't even want to mess around with these real small plants. Their preference is to have state inspection. Why? Because then they don't have to mess with it. I mean, that's their bottom line. They would just as soon have the state do it. The problem is they don't give the state, and I, uh, the professor I talked to today, Professor Sullivan, did say that they, they have some program now where they do give the states some money to support state meat inspection. But when this report came out 20 years ago, that was not there. If the USDA would fully fund state meat inspection, I think all 50 states would go to state meat inspection overnight. That's the overriding issue with probably Nebraska is where the funding is going to come from. And if the people that want state meat inspection, if there's enough capacity out there to pay for the overhead, the inspectors, and the things necessary to make it work. And I'm more willing to give this a shot if we can, if we've got the support from the processing community. I think the producer community is there because we want the shackle spaces, like I said. And I think the consumer is there also uh, because like Kevin said, I don't think a lot of people even understand how the USDA rolls and stamps and inspections, how all this works. 
And if it said Nebraska State inspection on it, I think they'd be fine with it, you know, as long as we have a quality product and a quality piece of meat. Yeah, thank you to both of you for those comments. Um, rolling off of some of what you both spoke about as far as the challenges or difficulties of working if you're a small meat locker with uh, federal inspection. Uh, could you say more about, you know, what expenses those might put on you or, or why it's difficult? I know in that UNL study, um, some of the people interviewed mentioned that federal inspectors don't want to give as much time or as much attention or are harder to get a hold of and don't have the flexibility and also can be tied to, you know, additional regulatory burdens for the small meat locker. So I just wondered if you had anything more to add about why specifically, what some of the challenges are to those processors and how the state meat inspection would make things easier and more flexible for them. Go, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I, I, so since, since state inspection has to be equivalent to federal inspection, um, I'm, I'm not sure it would be any less uh, onerous from a paperwork or facilities infrastructure point of view, where, where I believe uh, state meat inspection would be more beneficial is that I, I think the state could set up circuit inspection uh, or even a pay to play kind of inspection service that, uh, that you know, some of my customers, they want my federal inspection. They, they, that's what they want. That's what they desire. That's uh, what they're driving for. Some of my uh, customers are more than happy with custom exempt, right? Uh, and I, I don't have a fee either way because I, I operate within my eight hours of service that's provided. But um, I, I think if we could do a state inspection service, it would just, it would make things a little smoother and a little easier to transition between all the levels of inspection. Uh, I know for me personally, if there was state inspection, I'm not sure I would get have a federal stamp. I think for my customer base and for my capacity levels, uh, I'm not co-packing or, or producing uh, product that's shipping inordinate distances. Uh, um, so I, for me, I think state would be a great fit. Uh, you look at some guys that are a little bit step above me, uh, they, they are shipping product across state lines and they are doing some private label uh, businesses that, that do cross state lines. So it, it's just an option and an opportunity, I think, that would, uh, is that, like I, I keep saying, and I, and I hate to repeat myself, but that one size fits all the federal government has. Uh, and, and I'm very fortunate. Uh, the, my on-site inspector is, uh, is a great guy, and uh, him and I spend a lot of time talking, and, and our, my local, my vet uh, is also uh, extraordinarily helpful. Um, and they understand that, uh, you know, uh, I have my own struggles. I'm in a very old facility. My facility was built in 1952. And until I did a remodel on it, it really hadn't had a lot of changes made to it since 52. Uh, so, you know, there's things that they would love to see me change with my facility, but I just, my, my four walls are what they are. I can't do a lot of things differently in, in some areas. And, and so we have to accommodate that in different forms and uh, sometimes it adds some inefficiency in my system, sometimes not. So let me back up here a second, and I'm not sure everybody understands when we talk about custom exempt. What custom exempt is, is in a lot of our little towns, we've got a locker plant. And when you kill at that locker, you're going to put a label on that meat This is not for sale. So like this beef I picked up, the other day has Tom Brandt on that label. And I sell five or six beef to people through the year. I deliver those beef to the locker already sold to that individual. He has to own that animal at the locker before it's killed. Okay. And because the locker is just killing that individual's animal, he does not need an inspector there during the kill. When we go to either a state or a federally inspected plant, you have to have an inspector there during the kill. Is that right, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. They, they have. That's really 
the only part of the process where they do hands-on inspection is is at harvest. They right. they inspect the viscera. They, they, it, they do a uh, they do an anti-mortem inspection and they do a post-mortem inspection. So the advantage of a state program versus USDA, and I believe the inspectors are still in a union, is uh, it can be very difficult sometime to find USDA inspectors to come out on that one day a kill a week in these little towns and they can only work so many hours and you have to have a, an office for them and you have to have, uh, and I don't know what, every little plant's probably a little different, it's how well you get along with the inspector, but there's some very specific rules. The advantage of a state inspection would be, we think there would be more flexibility because you would maybe have two or three inspectors for the state and they would work with the 50, 60, or 100 locations in the state, and maybe they would be a little more flexible on this. But there would be absolutely no difference in the cleanliness of the plant and, and those rules. But from an education standpoint and working with that small locker, Kevin said his facility was built in 52. I can tell you if you build a facility today, you wouldn't use any of the materials that are in that locker. It would be 100% different. Uh, from bacteria and washdown and everything else. Uh, so uh, that maybe would be an advantage for Kevin uh, with state inspection. Uh, they might work with him a little more on that. That's, uh, that leads a little bit into the next question in the study, um, which there may not be as much to say about um, because it is sort of built in. But that question is, you know, how does a state meat inspection ensure that it's uh, meeting or exceeding the same levels of uh, thoroughness and cleanliness as uh, the federal inspection program. Um, and then an additional note about how uh, that would not affect the general fund. So if you have any remarks on that, uh, we'd be happy to hear them as well. The, the rules are exactly the same. The state has no leeway on those rules. So that's easy. You gotta follow the federal rules on cleanliness and, and meat inspection. Um, funding is going to be a problem. Uh, we've, got, we've got COVID, we've got an uncertain financial situation with the state. Uh, everybody's aware of this, and it isn't just Nebraska, it's a worldwide epidemic. It's going to be very difficult to do any new funding on a lot of things next year. If you come with a bill, you need to bring a revenue source with that bill. If we wanna do state funding, we're gonna to have to show that that cash flows, that that state funding or that state inspection generates enough funding to run the program. I think that's probably how it's gonna to have to work. Great, thank you. We'll, uh move into that uh, next question then, which is um, what sort of programs in other states uh, stimulate the expansion of local meat processing? And I, the scope of this might go a little bit beyond just the inspection program, but um, what other policies are there that other states have used to stimulate that local uh, meat economy? So I know uh, uh, in Oklahoma and Texas, there are state programs, uh, grants, loans, uh, specifically geared to, uh, uh, especially since the pandemic, to, to reinstall uh, the local locker. I, I mean, it used to be anywhere, especially in the Midwest and down into the South, uh, but there was a local locker in, in almost every town. Uh, you know, but since we've centralized into the urban areas, a lot of those lockers have closed. Uh, there's a, there's still a lot of locker closures going on even here in uh, eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, simply because um, guys are old. I mean they're uh, they're they're getting of an age and they're wanting to retire, and it's hard to find uh, folks that want to get into this business. It's a, it's a dying art. It's a dying business. Uh, I mentioned in my introduction I started cutting meat when I was eight. Uh, that was uh, that was back in the 70s when everything came in on rails. Uh, I, I'm still old enough, Senator Brand. If you came from out of IBP, uh, I'm 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 old enough to remember shrouded cattle coming in the back room, yep. you know. And then 
and then they took the shrouds off and then it was box beef and you know, it's, uh, uh, so you know there's those are things that I remember and I worked with that that uh, I'm a little different even in my age bracket but the locker is that it was dying uh, I think uh, this pandemic is going to re uh, reinvigorate our segment I think we are going to have um, Folks, because uh, there was, uh, especially in the urban areas, we had a lot of customers come up from Omaha that booked hands and quarters with us. And I, I've gone out and bought cattle and, and, and covered those orders. And they're already reordering. They, they've discovered that the way that their grandparents bought in, in bulk and once or twice a year is a better product. It's uh, better economics. It's a lot of cash up front, but it's better economics in the long run. Uh, and there's a convenience factor of just always having a good product in your freezer and not having to run to the grocery store. So I think we're going to see an invigoration. But as far as other states, I know Texas and Oklahoma do have some state programs. I can't speak too much about any other states. Those are the two I'm most familiar with. Your, your first and foremost most source of funding will be the USDA. They have programs for this. Um, I know people are, are constantly looking at this. Uh, my advice to somebody that's going to do this, make sure you have a market before you build something. Make sure you understand who's going to buy this. Uh, it's real easy to build something. It's really hard to sell something. Uh, so whatever your plan is, whether it's beef or pork or sheep or chickens or, or you know, whatever, make sure you've got the market uh, to build the, build the, uh, bricks and mortar uh, is pretty straightforward. After the USDA, with COVID going on, there's a couple of unique programs I'm aware of. In Montana, they took a million dollars of the CARES money that they got from the federal government, and they are giving $150,000 grants to people that start lockers. I think in Nebraska, we could have possibly done that. Uh, the governor got a short half a billion dollars in CARES money. Uh, a lot of this got distributed through various programs. The bigger ones would be like the livestock stabilization grants, and I hope some of you got those. But we put $100 million into that program, uh, and that basically uh, provided about 8,300 grants to livestock producers. We could have taken a million dollars off the top of that and done a program like that. And I think if you'd have got five or six more lockers in the state of Nebraska, that would have been money well spent. That would have been a few more shackle spaces. And either in Wyoming or Colorado, uh, one of the state senators there did sort of a quirky thing to try and get around the custom exempt law, where I said, I had to sell you a whole beef or a half a beef you know, I'll take a beef in and half goes to this guy and half goes to this guy, is somehow they were going to introduce legislation that sold you like one one hundredth of a herd or of a cow. And it, it sort of skirts the law and they were sort of willing to look at that because we had so much livestock not getting harvested uh, that they were willing to consider that. I don't think that went anywhere, but that was sort of a unique approach to it. And another thing that South Dakota did when they saw that the hogs were getting backed up, particularly at the time that Smithfield and Sioux Falls had so many problems, the Department of Ag got the list of deer permits from Game and Parks, and they sent out a letter to all the deer hunters that told them it's just as easy to skin a hog as skin a deer. And so that those guys, you know, maybe we we'll go knock on the door of a hog producer and, and do that. I know here in Nebraska, uh, and I'll use Firth as an example, there was a producer down there that just went down the street and knocked on doors. He got rid of 40 fat hogs in about an hour and a half. And these are people that had never butchered before. They sort of knew they could go to YouTube or they had the equipment for deer. And yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And it's sort of an adventure. It's something else to do with your family. So there's a lot of out of the box thinking on this, uh, but by and large, your, your big dog in the fight is gonna be USDA. And I think it's probably USDA Rural Development uh, that is the one that would have funds uh, for development of a, of a packing plant. 
Great, we'll move into that final question from the study then, which asks, uh, how can we support investment in custom and small plant processing and expand uh, direct to consumer marketing of inspected meat? Go ahead, Kevin. So, so <clears throat> the, the easiest way to talk about support and uh, everybody on this call knows this, it's to shop local. You know, it is to support that that local locker and that local producer and, and to, and to uh, uh, move those purchase dollars. I mean, the more profitable you make these kinds of businesses, the more opportunity that just comes out of that. So, uh, it, you know, that's the, that's the easiest way to support. I think uh, the other way would be uh, talk to your legislatures, both at the state and federal level. Uh, also talk to your, uh, to your area, uh, town and city. Uh, you know, some towns would welcome a locker, other towns would not for uh, a variety of reasons on both sides. So I think it's just uh, educating people. There's still, uh, uh, over the length of my career, I'm always amazed at the amount of uh, misinformation that is out there about our protein supply here in the country and, and what it looks like and, and, and where our proteins come from and, and how they're produced. And so as producers and as, and as, uh, uh, and as processors, it, it's on our shoulders to, to educate one person at a time is really the only way you can do it. You know, the, uh, uh, the internet's a powerful place and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so we just have to make sure that we combat that with, with facts and real information. I would say there's a lot of opportunity in the state of Nebraska. Uh, we probably produce more finished red meat than any other state in the nation between uh, beef and pork. And we haven't even talked about chickens. What we've talked about so far, basically we've been dealing with red meat regulations. Today, and I see Dave Welsh is up here and I know Dave does chickens, is I think you can do up to 20,000 chickens uh, without a permit. And Dave can come on and correct me here shortly, but I know he's, he's one of the guys here that does that. There's a real opportunity in Nebraska for niche marketing. Uh, people wanna buy local, they wanna buy from the farmer, they wanna see where their meat's coming from, uh, boutique beef, um, there's value added opportunities. Uh, we've got a lot of Holstein steers in this state that sell for a very low amount of money. And for you people out there that feed cattle, I can feed a Holstein steer a high percentage of corn, marble that steer out, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that Holstein and one of my Angus steers. Now, there's some, some physiological differences when you cut, cut this thing up that I could probably tell a little bit of difference but the quality of the meat can be the same. So there's a lot of opportunities in Nebraska. And I think a lot of the people listening uh, tonight are from rural areas. And there's probably a lot of opportunities, like Kevin said, depending on what town you're in, I can tell you your biggest obstacle with our small towns are gonna be their water supply and their sewer system. Uh, there's a lot of biologicals in a packing plant that need to be filtered out before it ever makes it to the sewer system, you're probably gonna be in a position where you need a lagoon uh, to settle things out just for this packing plant. And if you could solve that problem for the city, I think they're gonna be all over it. If you're gonna kill livestock, you probably don't want that uh, facility in town for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, just complaints about the noise, the odor, uh, flies, there can be some of that, but a well-managed facility isn't gonna have any of that. Um, one thing that's a problem in the state, not only for lockers, but also for producers is rendering. Uh, we've got one rendering company pretty much left in the state and they do whatever they want. And yes, we don't do. have a lot of control over that. And I think anybody that's in the, in the livestock or the packing uh, business here knows that. I found it interesting that Kevin doesn't have a market for his hides. Uh, that's unfortunate. There's another opportunity for somebody to collect all the hides from all these little packers and start a tannery somewhere. We did that at IBP. It's a, it's a very intense process to uh, create good leather. 
So I mean, there's, there's a lot of opportunities in the state of Nebraska. It's a way to bring young people back home into the state. And uh, I think the cities have some monies available. Uh, the state has some monies available. Check with Department of Economic Development and USDA. Uh, so, and with that, Nathan. Thank you again for your responses to that. We're gonna move into our questions from the people who are listening in now. We've already got uh, a number of good questions in the queue here, and I welcome anybody else who's been waiting to enter yours as well. Um, first of all, we'll start off with this question from Troy and Susan, and, and uh, they ask, considering that 90% of the food Nebraskans eat is imported into the state from elsewhere, has there been any economic studies done to the increased economic benefit for local food producers in local area by being able to sell uh, locally to restaurants and customers, especially for grass-fed beef, pasture, pork, poultry, and other livestock? Well, was, I guess, that, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm sure there have been studies on that. Uh, I know our office is sponsoring an interim study on uh, farm to school, uh, which is an opportunity for, for local producers to get not only red meats, but produce into our schools. So that's something that we're looking at on the interim. Uh, but I can't, I can't address that specifically what's been done in the past. Uh, sure. but, but this is probably the, the main one on livestock for the interim is going to be state inspection in the farm to school. Uh, a question that may be a little bit easier to answer is, uh, George Cunningham asked why Nebraska does not have a state, meat inspec a state meat inspection program. I know there was one at one point um, decades ago, but uh, if either of you have uh, an explanation for why it went away, that would be interesting to hear. There was a point in time and, and this report from, and I don't have the report in front of me, so I apologize, but this UNL report uh, in 1967, 1968, they did something with the USDA uh, that made it more homogenous through the United States and that allowed states to get rid of state inspection. And the USDA, Meat inspection was created, I think, in 1906, 1912, way back at the turn of the century. And that was in response to Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. I think a lot of us have read that. If not, I would encourage you to read that. And that exposed the packing industry and all the ills at that time that were involved with that. And the public outcry dictated that we have a national meat inspection. It was when they said that the state inspection had to meet the federal, I think that's when we got rid of state inspections because there was no incentive to keep it if they were gonna pay for federal inspection. That's my understanding and some of that could be a little inaccurate. No, that's, uh, uh, that's my understanding in general across the states is that um, uh, once the equivalency rule came into place uh, and there was no funding, it, the state inspection became basically redundant at, at that point. And so uh, a lot of the states just pushed that function off to the feds since uh, you had to meet those standards anyway. All right, we'll go to our next question um, from uh, Graham Christensen, who asks, can state meat inspection be combined with adoption of cooperative interstate shipment programs or CIS to allow state inspected plants to have interstate abilities? I, th I think the Senator addressed that uh, earlier when he talked about uh, states that have state inspection can enter reciprocity agreements uh, to where you can move from that state, uh, one state to a second specific state, but it's not an open border uh, situation. So, uh, you know, so like we could, uh, uh, Nebraska could have state inspection and then we could partner with border states, so to speak, to expand our marketplace, but it's got to be a reciprocity state inspection to state inspection. 
Sure. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that that was covered well. I don't know if you have anything to add, Senator. No, I was just going to say, my understanding is each state has to sign an agreement with another state. So if there's 25 other states, Nebraska would have to sign 25 different agreements uh, for reciprocity. It doesn't have to be just the border states. We could skip over Iowa and we could go to Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or you know wherever uh, we could get that reciprocity. Uh, okay, we'll go to our next one. What policy changes can we enact at the state level, just to kind of zoom out and take a, a broader view? What policy changes can we enact at the state level that would make it easier for Kevin to do his job and for new lockers uh, like his to get started? Kevin's got to answer that. <laughs> uh, you know, since since the since meat and the meat inspection acts uh, is mostly governed at the federal level, right? So all the state policies are basically mandated or mirrored to the federal policies that are mandated. So I'm not sure there's a lot the state can do. Uh, there's some that local municipalities can do uh, as far as, uh, uh, but Senator Brandt's correct, that the two biggest hurdles to expansion or building new is water treatment and uh, disposal, whether it be hide, render, and you're right, there's only one render company in the state and they, they are the definite 300 pound gorilla. They just do what they want to do and they charge what they want to charge. And they show up when they want to show up. That's the, that's exactly right. Um, uh, like I mentioned in my uh, at the beginning, I uh, am working with a couple of uh, uh, local uh, feed yards that are doing composting, and basically trying to figure a way to gather my material in a way that they can then haul and compost, uh, and, and that way it'll turn into a revenue stream for someone. Uh, if I'm just trying to cut cut the bleeding on those on those services, so if I could create if I could create a revenue stream for someone that's a it's a good compost material that can be land applied uh, and sold bagged and sold also, uh, and it's not a huge burden if you're already working compost piles. Uh, currently, all my hides just go to the dumpster, go to the landfill, and so those to me are the biggest hurdles. Uh, we have another question from Andrew Tunnies who asks, uh, well, first of all, states that uh, he booked in 12 hogs at a local butcher for September of 2021. So uh, he's wondering, and he was lucky to get them good in. For you. He's wondering, yeah, good for you. <laughs> um, so what can we do to quickly increase that capacity of small local processing? Um, is there a way to build that out, you know, in the near, in the near uh, term future? I can tell you short term in the area that I live, uh, Diller Locker, Pickerel Locker, each of them have hired two or three people. I'm sure Kevin's trying to or has hired more people. Uh, you can push your capacity somewhat. A lot of your capacity is limited by the size of that freezer and people need to show up to pick their product up uh, because if, you, if you're supposed to pick it up on Monday and you don't show up till Wednesday, that throws a big wrench in the plans. I think our lockers are doing an outstanding job. And if I had to guess, they're probably pushing 110% of capacity and getting every shackle space they can out of this thing. Um, because a lot of times in the past, if I had a down animal, something maybe broke its leg and we would do an emergency butcher, uh, they've been more than happy to help us out on a deal like that. And I'm sure they're still doing those functions. So you've got, you've got those functions in addition to uh, the regular regular business, um, but I would I would bet that the the state of Nebraska's capacity is probably over a hundred percent. Kevin, I, I agree. I'm I'm operating in that 110. Uh, so it, when you get down to well, it's not even the local locker, but uh, every every uh, processing facility all the way up to uh, Dakota City or Liberal Kansas, your 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 two biggest constraints is refrigeration or three, refrigeration uh, for the local locker, you'd have to add, add freezer space, as Senator Brandt mentioned, and people. 
uh, just skilled labor. Uh, because at the local locker, everybody does everything, right? The guy that kills the cattle is also the guy that's boning the cattle. And this guy, that, the guy that's making the sausage, you know, you're just moving from station to station. I did have to hire people. It took me a long time to find people that were willing to work. Uh, the federal government, in my opinion, didn't help us with the extra $600 a week that they were giving folks. It just disincentivized people to work. Uh, freezer space, I'm not going to say it's easily solved, but there's mobile units. The real constraint that causes problems is your cooler space because uh, uh, most lockers, like myself, we're going to hang those carcasses for at least two weeks on beef. Uh, uh, and, and so to move that through the system uh, requires a lot of cooler space. That's just a lot of storage. A uh, couple of things you can do is you can uh, shorten that aging time and you know, you could get away with eight to 10 days uh, without too much problem on the product. I just don't like to go there personally. Uh, but we won't, you know, we used to do 21 days on request and I won't even do that anymore just because I don't have the, have the rail space. Uh, but cooler expansions are very expensive. And uh, right now, like everybody else, uh, delayed. You know, it's not like I could call and get a cooler installed in the next six weeks. It might be a year before I could get on somebody's line. So there is, there is a unique concept out there, and Friesla is the name of the company. And they're in Washington, Oregon, and a lot of you maybe have heard about these mobile processing plants that started about 10 years ago, and they took a semi-trailer, and they go out to the ranch, and they'll kill 15 head on my ranch, and then tomorrow they go to Kevin's, and they'll kill another 15 head. And this was a, a portable processing plant. And the University of Nebraska actually has a small one of these units. They actually make pods uh, without wheels that set down on a concrete slab and you can plug in the water and you can plug in the electricity. And so then you can get a slaughter pod. It's about the, the size of a semi-trailer or a sea cargo container. And the next pod is the hot box or the chilling box. And the next pod is a processing pod. And the next one is a freezer. And they actually have this so that you can hook these pods together and you could get up and running on their system in about six months, providing you've got your permits in place. They basically say you need a concrete slab and your hookups. Now, Kevin's got experience, I've got experience. They didn't allow for welfare areas, offices, uh, maintenance areas. Uh, restrooms, that would have to be a separate unit. But there is a way around this. And then this pod system for about a short million dollars, you would get about 75 head a week or 150. I don't remember which. And if you want to add capacity to this, you set up another line of pods. And it's really sort of an interesting concept. It's all self-contained. Uh, but that's something outside of what we normally see uh, construction of a uh, mortar, brick and mortar uh, processing plant. And there were not, there haven't been a lot of these built in the state of Nebraska. I'm very fortunate the one I picked my beef up from yesterday at Pickerel, that is a brand new locker. That's only like three years old. And I would bet that's probably the newest one in the state. Uh, but it's pretty rare. Um, they tore down the old one and they came in and built a new one right on the same site, right in downtown. So. We're coming up now uh, to sort of the final minutes of our event. Um, so I want to ask um, if you would each kind of offer your concluding thoughts and in those you would conclude, you would include sort of a 30,000 foot discussion. If you were talking to somebody maybe from Omaha or Lincoln or another more urban area who's not as close to these processes, uh, why, why should they care that um, local meat lockers and, and smaller producers are surviving and thriving in the future? Why, why should they care about the state meat inspection program and, and what's kind of the broader significance of it? Um, thank you. Have you ever been to Walmart? <laughs> and when you go to Walmart, look at the quality of meat. You do not see a lot of white fat flecks in the meat. When I worked at IBP, it was in the 80s. And what was very interesting is we spent a ton of money interviewing consumers. And they'd go in the grocery stores and they'd talk to the people shopping at the meat section. And 
I want lean beef. I want red meat. And then they turn around and they would buy prime high choice with a lot of fat in it. Fat is flavor. Corn creates flavor. Nebraska has the best meat in the world. A high percentage of our meat hits the coast and goes to the white tablecloth restaurants. A high percentage of our meat goes overseas. The Smithfield plant I sell hogs to, 25% of the production goes to Japan. Uh, it's just the high dollar cuts. This is why you should care if you live in Nebraska. Eat the good stuff. Let somebody else eat the Walmart stuff. And you can do that in a niche market. I see Dave smiling over there. Dave produces high quality chickens on his farm. And you know it's unfortunate he isn't part of this discussion so we could talk about the chicken. But that's how we add value. Uh, I feed a high percentage of corn. I create a high, high value animal. Uh, I'm not getting paid for it by the big four. If I can sell it to a small processor like Kevin and get paid what it's worth or have him process it and I'll retail it myself. That has a value, and if it takes state meat inspection to do it, let's do it. Uh, but this will bring young people back to our communities. And usually if you have a uh, young people running a locker, uh, they're gonna be around a long time and it helps that tax base, it helps that school. And usually you have producers that will sell hogs and cattle. Uh, they may not be very big producers, uh, but a lot of our little local lockers, if you come in and say, I want a beef, they got a go-to guy, but Kevin's got some go-to people if, if you need a hog or a beef, and he knows where to go. Go ahead, Kevin, add to that. No, that, that's absolutely all, all, all true. Uh, the, 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 if I'm talking to urban audiences, and, and I do get the opportunity to get out and talk to some folks, is, is it, um, the, the reason they should care, I think, was demonstrated just so beautifully with the supply interruptions we had <clears throat> excuse me, back in March, March and April. Uh, I, here in Blair, we have a family fair and we have a Walmart. Uh, uh, and um, both ran out of product. They had no meat in the case, not a pound. Uh, but you know who always had product? Me. Uh, I never ran out and I never closed down. Uh, and I organized and re rearranged uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, to where I was buying cattle and because I am federally inspected and this is where state inspection would be of huge help is I was able to feed my own uh, my own cooler case right so people would come in and I always had ground beef and I had steaks and I had whatever anybody needed we did have to limit some because I, I do have capacity limitations but we never ran out and so that's what the local locker provides that's what the local producer provides uh, if we are going to live our lives dependent on uh, the commodity uh, that is created by the big four, uh, then we're going to have to depend on, on what they uh, 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 decide they want to kill or what they're capable of. Uh, the local guy, the small guy, we're not impacted by a lot of the, a lot of the things that are talked about on the news and in the marketplace. Uh, you know, cattle go up, cattle go down, corn goes up, corn goes down. But there's still every town surrounded, especially in Nebraska, by farmer feeders. It's like Senator said, these guys aren't feeding thousands of cattle, but they're going to feed a couple hundred or, you know, I've got guys that feed 50 a year and they've got the, they sell the 50 head to the same families and people sometimes for several generations. Uh, and that's what your local locker provides. And that's what people need to understand and grasp. Uh, and that's, I think that's where state inspection would give us a benefit. I know there was a lot of lockers that would have loved to, to do what I did and, and help, but they weren't federally inspected. So that's just not even an option. They can't grind cattle or, or, or make sausages and just sell it out their counter. They have to buy product in. I, I, I was uh, fortunate in that I had options. I didn't, uh, you know, my distributor uh, that I do buy box beef and pork and, and things from, he ran out. They, they could, I, I use two big, two of the biggest distributors in the country are who I deal with uh, uh, out of Minnesota. One's out of Minnesota and one's out of Chicago. And they both ran out of product, just had none to ship me. But because I had inspection, I was able to uh, uh, improvise and adapt. Uh, and I think that's where state inspection would help. 
Thank you so much to both of you. I think those are two very excellent answers and we had a really interesting and informative discussion. So I really appreciate, appreciate your being here and taking the time to share with us. Uh, and I know that all of our audience uh, will appreciate it as well. So uh, with that, we are uh, right exactly on the nose. We did a good job at seven o'clock. So we'll conclude the meeting, but uh, thank you again and we'll see you around. Thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, so long.